Okay, let's begin with the skull osteology. We'll do all the main bones first. So looking at the front of the skull, we had the mandible, the lower jaw. We have the maxilla here, the upper jaw. Turn this a little bit. Here we have the zygomatic bone, okay, a little bit more. Here we have the temporal bone. Going back to the front, here's the frontal bone. And up top here we have the two parietal bones. Then we turn it around on the posterior side and here we have the occipital bone. Staying here on the occipital bone, we have this point right here, which is called the external occipital protuberance. And moving laterally off of this point is where we have what we call the superior nuchal line. We come drop down inferiorly from there and along this line here is going to be the inferior nuchal line. Come over to the side and on the temporal bone here, we have a couple of features. Uh, this process here, which hangs down off the temporal bone, is called the mastoid process. The opening here is the external auditory meatus. And if we go just below the external auditory meatus and anterior to the um, mastoid process, we have this skinnier process here called the styloid process. Uh, over in this area here, we have an arch that we can push the probe underneath here. That's called the zygomatic arch, and that's formed by a ramus off of the temporal bone and also a ramus off of the zygomatic bone. They join together right here to form that zygomatic arch. Uh, moving down onto the mandible here, we have this point on the front of the mandible. It's called the mental protuberance. Turn this to the side, come back. Here's the body of the mandible. This corner here is called the angle of the mandible, and here we have a projection going superiorly. That's the ramus of the mandible, and that splits into two different parts here, uh, two processes. Uh, the more posterior process here is going to be the condyloid process. The more anterior one is going to be the coronoid process. And notice the condyloid process has that word condyle in there, and that's the process that the jaw is going to pivot on. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's move over to the front here. Um, uh, a couple other bones we have on the front here. The bridge of your nose are where we have the nasal bones. If we turn this a little bit and we look into the orbital socket here, we have the lacrimal bones here and here. Uh, we also have a couple of openings here on the front of the skull. We have two above the orbital sockets. We have two here below the orbital sockets and we have two down here on the mandible. This is going to be the supraorbital foramen, infraorbital foramen, and mental foramen down here. And the branches of the trigeminal nerve are going to emerge through those pockets. Here we're going to have the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, here the maxillary branch, and down here the mental branch. Uh, inside the nose we can see this plate going up and down that's going to be the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. And, okay, let's switch over to the inferior side. Now looking down um, at the inferior side of the skull, we see this large opening here that's going to be the forium and magnum. Uh, that's going to show where the spinal cord is going to connect into the brain. On either side of the forium and magnum, we have two saddles. These are called occipital condyles. If we go anterior and lateral to the occipital condyles, we have two openings here. We have this one here, and we have this one here. The more posterior of the two is going to be the jugular fossa, and the more anterior of the two here is going to be the carotid canal. You can see the same thing on this side. There's the jugular fossa, and there's the carotid canal. Uh, also down here, here we can see where right here is the back of that ethmoid plate, and the bottom part of it on this posterior edge here is called the vomer. If we look up here on the roof of your mouth, this is where we're going to have the palatine bone. All right, let's go over on this side. Let's open up the skull here. And here, looking inside the skull, here's anterior side, here's the posterior side, okay? Um, towards the front, this is going to be the bottom of the frontal bone. In between that, we see the spots where the olfactory nerve sits. So this perforated bone here is going to be called the cribriform plate. The, the, the ridge sticking up in between that is called the cristigalli. Posterior to that, we have the sphenoid bone. This part of it here, this ridge along here is the lesser wing of the sphenoid. And looking back in here, and here is the greater wing of the sphenoid in this area. A couple features on the sphenoid bone. We have the openings here coming out of the back of the eye sockets. Those are for the optic nerves. In between the two openings for the optic nerves, we have a groove here called the um, 
optic chiasmatic groove. Behind that, we have a depression where the pituitary gland sits. That's the pituitary fossa or the hypophyseal fossa. And the ridge here and here on either side is called the cella tersica on the anterior side and the dorsum cellae on the posterior side. All right, let's put the skull back together. And lastly, let's look at the sutures on the skull. Um, and here, here's the anterior side of the skull. Here's the posterior side. We see that we have two sutures here that fall in a primary plane. So you have the coronal suture going this way, and we have the sagittal suture going this way. If we look back here, between the two parietal bones and the occipital bones, we have the lambdoidal suture going around this way. And then if we look on the lateral side of the skull here, in between the temporal bone and the parietal bone, we have the squamous suture here. Okay, moving on to the scapula. Uh, let's do the borders of the scapula first. So we're holding it, we're looking at the posterior side of the scapula. This would be the lateral border over here. This would be the medial border on this side here. Um, if you follow the medial border all the way up to the top is where you're going to have the superior angle. If you follow the lateral border all the way down to the bottom is where you're going to have the inferior angle of the scapula. Uh, another prominent feature, we can see the spine of the scapula along the back here. The spine is going to divide two fossas on the posterior side of the scapula. This pocket down here, this whole area is going to be called the infraspinous fossa below the spine and then this pocket up here is going to be the supraspinous fossa above the spine. If we follow the spine out to the end we can see here that it flattens out into a blade-like prominence called the acromion process. Uh, if we turn the scapula over to the anterior side here we can see that this whole pocket here is going to be called the subscapular fossa. Uh, you can see along the top border of the scapula here that we have a little notch that's the suprascapular notch. And then right next to it here, you can see a process coming out at us here, uh, and that's called the coracoid process. If we turn over, so we're looking at the lateral side, now we can see those two processes more clearly, a chromium process here, a coracoid process here, and in between we see the socket of your shoulder joint, that's gonna be the glenoid fossa. Uh, there's a little bump on the top and a little bump on the bottom. This is gonna be the superglenoid tubercle, and that's going to be the infra glenoid tubercle. All right, the other thing you need to do with the scapula is to be able to orient it. Uh, anytime you want to orient a bone, you need to pick a feature that is uh, either points superiorly or inferiorly, something that points laterally, medially, something that points anteriorly or posteriorly. Posteriorly, You need two of those things, two directions. So for us, we're going to take the spine of the scapula, that's always going to point posteriorly, and we're going to take the acromion process, which is always going to point laterally. And that will mean that this particular scapula goes on the left side of our body. Okay, because if we try to put it on the right, then the acromion process would be pointing medially instead of laterally. So this is going to go over here, like that. Okay. Let's move on to the vertebrae. And... Here, we're going to start with the cervical vertebrae. So we have seven cervical vertebrae. Uh, and here we can see the difference in appearance between uh, some of the cervical vertebrae. This one here is going to be CN1. This is your atlas. Or I'm not CN1, sorry, C1, which is your atlas. Uh, this one here is going to be C2. And this one here will be a typical one a little further down, maybe C4, C5. Okay, let's look at the, the atlas. And we can see there that the atlas, the character, uh, a characteristic trait of this one is that it does not have a body. Uh, some other things we can see, we see these openings on either side. Those are transverse foramen. All cervical vertebrae are gonna have that. That's a distinguishing feature of all cervical vertebrae. Uh, here we have where the occipital condyles from the skull, remember, if we look back at the skull here, these saddles there and there, are going to sit in these receptacles here and here. So that's going to be your um, the joint between your skull and C1. That's the one that allows the skull to flex and extend. Basically say the word yes, nod your head up and down, that's that joint there. Uh, if we take the atlas and we rest it on top of C2, which is the axis, we can see here that this becomes a pivot point for C1. So where these bones are able to spin this way, and that's turning your head side to side, laterally rotating it, or saying the word no. Uh, so here, this projection here is called the dens, uh, and that's the unique feature of C2, the axis 
all right, which is this vertebrae. We see we still have these transverse foramen on either side. Okay. Now moving down onto a more typical uh, cervical vertebrae where all the other ones, C3 through 7, are going to look like more like this one. We can see that one feature is that the spinous process here is forked. We call that a bifid spinous process and most of the cervical vertebrae are going to have that. We still see the transverse foramen here, okay? And now we're starting to see some other things coming off of the vertebrae on the sides, on the top, on the bottom here. And we're gonna describe them a little bit more on some of the uh, vertebrae that are further down. One thing we know here is now we're starting to see a much more defined body on the vertebrae here, okay? Next, we're gonna have a thoracic vertebrae. Now we can see if we look at the thoracic vertebrae from the side that the spinous process on a thoracic vertebrae is much longer than it is on the cervical vertebrae and when we look here we see that the cervical vertebrae spinous process points much more posteriorly almost straight out where the thoracic spinous process points uh, more down. So the long inferiorly pointing spinous process for a thoracic vertebrae is a characteristic feature. Uh, if we look at the top of this here, we can see that we have a body here that's going to be on the anterior side. We see we have an opening here that's going to be the vertebral canal. We have these processes here coming off to the side. Those are transverse processes. We already mentioned the spinous process here which points posteriorly. And if we look at it from the side, we also see we have some processes pointing up those are superior articular processes and down here we have some processes pointing down those are inferior articular processes uh, one other feature on the thoracic vertebrae is that on the side there's going to be a little divot here uh, which is where the ribs are going to attach those are called costal facets and only thoracic vertebrae have those all right moving over to lumbar vertebrae here, we look at a lumbar vertebrae from the side. We can see that the spinous process is shorter, uh, and we can see the end of it is more blunt than it was on the uh, thoracic vertebrae. And if we hold a, a thoracic next to it here, we can see the difference, all right? Much longer spinous process here for thoracic, uh, much shorter one here for lumbar. Now, looking at a lumbar vertebrae here, now we can see all the same features. We have the body. We have the vertebral canal here. We have the transverse processes here, spinous process here. Look at it from the side. Here's the superior articular process, inferior articular process. Uh, now, looking at looking at the vertebral canal here on the lumbar vertebrae, we can see that the vertebral canal is going to be made up of two parts. Part of it is the base of the canal is formed by the body of the vertebrae. And then the top of the canal is formed by something called the neural arch. Now the neural arch has all these processes connected to it, but if we stripped those processes off, we'd be left with just an arch coming around this way to form the vertebral canal. Now the neural arch is formed up of two parts. Here and here are the bases of the neural arch. Those are called the pedicles. And then right in here is the curved part that connects the two bases, and that's going to be called the lamina. So we have a pedicle, a pedicle, and a lamina here, and that forms that neural arch. Uh, now, if we look at it, uh, we did that right. Okay, if we take two uh, lumbar vertebrae and let's stack them on top of each other like that, okay. Once we do that, we can see that we create an opening going side to side here, and you can see the, the probe coming out of it here. That's going to be called an tr uh, intervertebral foramen and that's going to be where the spinal nerves exit out so if we look down this way we can see that the vertebral canal is maintained going down this way and that we have these openings going side to side so the spinal cords going down and the spinal nerves are exiting out the sides of these intervertebral foramen here we also need to be able to orient the vertebrae so here we're looking at a superior view of the vertebrae this would be a lateral view this would be an inferior view this would be an anterior view here. Okay, here we need to be able to orient the vertebrae. So this would be a superior view of the vertebrae. This would be an inferior view. This would be a lateral view, anterior view, posterior view.
So in doing this, we need to be able to figure out which way we're looking. We need to know what parts face where. So the body of the vertebrae points anteriorly, spinous process points posteriorly, transverse processes obviously point laterally. The other thing you want to look for is to know whether does it go this way or does it go this way. Okay, is to be able to look at the spinous process and know that the spinous process is always going to point inferiorly, where if we turn it upside down here, it clearly points up, which is no good. So this is the right way to do it. This is the lateral view with the uh, vertebrae oriented, with this side being the superior side and this side being the inferior side. Okay, over here we have the breastplate. The breastplate's made up of three different parts here. The top is called the manubrium. The middle part here is called the sternum and the bottom little point here is called the xiphoid process. We can see at the top of the manubrium here, we have a little groove called the jugular notch. In between the manubrium and the sternum, we have a joint here, it's the manubrial sternal joint. <clears throat> On the surface, this is also called the sternal angle. It's a, it's a piece of surface anatomy that you can palpate. And once you can palpate the sternal angle, we can see that at that level is where the second rib attaches, and that allows us to be able to count intercostal spaces. So if you know the second rib is here, then the first intercostal space is above it, second intercostal space below it, so on and so forth. Next to the breastplate, we have this lighter colored material here. This is all the costal cartilage. Uh, and if we move a little further over, we see the whitish stuff here. These are the actual rib bones. So in between the cartilage and the bone, we have a joint right here all on this line. Those are the costal chondrial joints where those two come together. The next thing you want to know is what type of ribs we have. And we can see over here that if we count the first seven ribs, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven down here, that each one of those ribs, if you move over to the costal cartilage attached to it, that that piece of costal cartilage attaches directly to the sternum. Each one of these have a direct connection. So those are going to be true ribs. If we move over a little further, we see that the next couple, eight, nine, and 10, that if we look at their uh, cartilages, that that cartilage comes over, comes over, they all join together and they all join into the cartilage for rib number seven. So eight, nine, and 10 are going to be false ribs. And then if we go all the way over to the side over here, we see the last two, rib 11 and rib 12, have no anterior connection at all. So those are going to be floating ribs. They're false and they're also floating. Uh, and then going around to the back here. Okay, here we can see along the back edge of the rib that right along this line here is where the ribs have their greatest amount of curvature. That's gonna be called the angle of the rib here. And then if we go in a little further over here and we look at where the ribs attach to the thoracic vertebrae, we can see that they touch in two spots. One spot's here and the other spot is in there. All right, this right here is where the tubercle of the rib attaches to the transverse process of a thoracic vertebrae. And in there is where the head of the rib is going to attach to the body of the uh, thoracic vertebrae. Uh, in between the tubercle and the head down there, and this area is where the neck is going to be.